I'm honoured to be welcoming Professor Catherine Nelson Piercy to open today's talks. Catherine is a Professor of Obstetric Medicine and Consultant Obstetric Physician, specialising in the care of women with medical problems during pregnancy. Catherine is also the immediate past president of the International Society of Obstetric Medicine and is very involved in research with over 200 publications. Today's session is an area where Thrombosis UK received many individual inquiries and too often have tragic outcomes. So it's of extreme importance to us. And I'm delighted to welcome Catherine to present the Cardinal Health sponsored symposium on VTE risk assessment during C-sections and the importance of timely prophylaxis. Catherine, over to you, thank you. Thank you very much, Joe, for that introduction and thank you for inviting me. Thank you for Cardinal for sponsoring me. These are my disclosures. Um, and this is what I plan to cover. I'm going to talk through, remind you of the um, Embrace data, that's the confidential inquiry into maternal death. <laughs> I've asked, I've been asked to talk specifically about the thrombosis risks after cesarean section. I'm going to talk about what these risks actually are, the levels of risks, and then towards the end of the talk, uh, talk a little bit about the different risk assessment models and the RCOG guideline. So first of all, the Embrace data. Just to orientate you, this top line are the, is the overall death rate, uh, which means deaths in pregnancy or six weeks postpartum, which is pretty static in the UK. This dotted line are indirect deaths. These are medical deaths. And this dashed line are direct deaths. They're obstetric deaths. Now, a pulmonary embolism is actually counted as a direct death, even though you can have a pulmonary embolism or a DVT outside pregnancy, it has always been count counted as a direct death in maternity because it's more common in pregnancy. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and you can see in the last confidential inquiry, um, thrombosis, and that's mainly PE, was the leading direct cause of maternal death, and there were 0.9 per 100,000 maternities. Uh, uh, that was the death rate. And this shows you the cumulative death rate from venous thromboembolism over um, the last 20, 30 years, and you can see that it's pretty much stuck. If we look at the actual numbers from the last inquiry, 32 women died in pregnancy or up to a year postpartum, 21 of those were during pregnancy or up to six weeks postpartum, and all but one died of a pulmonary embolus. One woman died of a cerebral venous thrombosis. Now, I've said the death rate was 0.92 per 100,000, and that compares to the previous triennia where the death rate was 1.39. So there was a fall, but actually that was not significant. So these women died mainly postpartum, because that's the time of greatest risk. And if we look at the first trimester deaths, uh, the uh, antenatal deaths, you can see they were in the first and second trimester. There were no deaths in the third trimester. Um, and that contrasts with the incidence of VTE, which I'll show you in a second. Alarmingly, a quarter of these women who died were under the age of 25. Five of them had a BMI over 40 and over half of them, improvements were identified in care, which might have made a difference to the outcome. In the uh, time before when we looked at VTE, so this is going back six years before that, um, you can see that the pattern was the same. Most women died postnatally. There were some th third trimester deaths, but antenatally, the time of greatest risk was the first trimester. Now, what this means is that if women are viewed as high risk enough to need thromboprophylaxis in pregnancy, then they need to be told that before they get pregnant because they don't meet their midwife until towards the end of the first trimester. So that means they need pre-pregnancy counseling. And if they've had a previous clot, they need to be advised that when they get pregnant, they need to start low molecular weight heparin as soon as they have a positive pregnancy test to cover this first trimester. This um, slide is taken from Norwegian data showing not the rate of death, but this is incidence of VTE in pregnancy. And you can see that like the deaths, <coughs> excuse me, most clots occur postpartum. But antenatally, um, the instance is clustered around the third trimester. In other words, this is the opposite of what happens when you look at death. So if 
if, if we look at just risk of blood clot, your highest risk times are immediately postpartum and in the third trimester. That contrasts with your time of risk of death. Now, if we go back to um, at the overweight and obesity issue, overall, of all the women who died of pulmonary embolism in pregnancy, um, three quarters of them were overweight or obese. That compares to 50% in the national data. Over half had a, were obese with a BMI over 30. Almost half had a BMI over 35. Two fifths had a BMI of 40, and 16% five women had a BMI of 45. In other words, obesity is hugely overrepresented in the women who die of pulmonary embolism in pregnancy. Now, the risk is not the same throughout pregnancy. Uh, many of you will be familiar with, with these excerpts, which are called vignettes from the confidential inquiry. This woman was extremely obese, she was older, she had a history of mental health problems, and she'd been admitted. Uh, to a mental health care facility in mid-pregnancy. Because she wasn't in an obstetric unit, no VTE assessment was performed. She gave birth at term and was prescribed thromboprophylaxis for seven days. She had several further admissions to the mental health care facility, but did not receive any thromboprophylaxis because VTE thromboprophylaxis is not on their radar. She sadly collapsed and died from a PE while she was an inpatient in the mental health unit. This next vignette summarizes what goes on in many labor wards and is a real issue. So this woman had learning difficulties and known risk factors for thromboembolism. Appropriately, she received antenatal thromboprophylaxis with low molecular weight heparin. She was admitted for induction of labor. She, and because she was being induced, <clears throat> her thromboprophylaxis was admitted. The induction was delayed and she eventually had an emergency cesarean section. She did receive postnatal thromboprophylaxis, but it was 60 hours between the time that she had her last dose antenatally and her first dose postnatally. She was then well supported by the community teams to administer her low molecular weight heparin, but she collapsed and died of a PE two weeks postpartum. Now, in this case, we were able to review the postmortem, and the postmortem showed a large pelvic vein thrombosis, and you can date clots on the autopsy. And this suggested that this clot had arisen at the time she gave birth. In other words, for our very high risk women, when we omit heparin for delivery and delivery is delayed for several days in this case, then the, and this case, that is when she formed her pelvic vein clot, which caused her death two weeks later. This woman was also morbidly obese, but she had no other risk factors. She had a spontaneous labor and birth and went home with 10 days thromboprophylaxis. Four weeks later, she collapsed uh, with breathlessness. She wasn't seen by a consultant in the emergency department for more than three hours. And a CTPA within the next hour showed a saddle embolus with bilateral pulmonary emboli and, a right, and right heart strain on echo. She got her first dose of low molecular weight heparin two hours later, but she subsequently collapsed and died. Thrombolysis was then given, but it was too late. Now, I hope you've all spotted the error in this case. She had a massive, submassive PE, and therefore um, she should have been treated with unfractionated heparin intravenously, not low molecular weight heparin, and she should have been offered systemic or catheter-directed thrombolysis. And this recommendation is taken from the European Society of Cardiology guidelines, which were updated in 2019 for the management of acute PE. And they state that thrombolysis or surgical embolectomy should be considered for pregnant women with high risk PE. That's what we used to call massive or submassive PE. So this is an infographic to help you with these extremely big PEs, which are life threatening. If the woman is collapsed with hypotension, she should go straight for rescue reperfusion therapy, which normally means systemic thrombolysis. If she is submassive, then um, you need to assess the clot burden with a CT, and you need to assess for any right ventricular dysfunction with echo. And in this situation, you look at the biomarkers, the BNP to check for heart strain, the troponin and the clot burden. And then you decide whether to give rescue reperfusion therapy, some form of thrombolysis, which means either 
systemic or catheter-directed thrombolysis. So the key messages from the Embrace um, inquiry are that VTE remains the leading direct cause of maternal death. The postpartum uh, period is the time of greatest risk. As I've shown you, obesity is overrepresented in the women who died with two fifths having a BMI of 40. The risk is dynamic, which means that we need to uh, uh, make sure that women undergo repeat risk assessments at booking when she's admitted if she's admitted when she develops any intercurrent problems such as COVID or preeclampsia. And in women who, who are receiving antenatal thromboprophylaxis, then we need to plan the induction and delivery to minimize the time spent off low molecular weight heparin. So we can't control the delays on labor ward, but we could give thromboprophylaxis for another day if that induction has been delayed. We need to ensure that women in whom we think require six weeks postpartum thromboprophylaxis, that they get the whole uh, supply and that we don't send them off to their GP or tell them to go to pharmacy or come back to the hospital to get their supply. They need to leave hospital with the full supply. And lastly, we need to manage high-risk PE as if the woman was not pregnant and consider thrombolysis. So why is um, PE such a risk postpartum? Well, you'll be aware of Virchow's triad, which states that thrombosis is due to venous stasis, endothelial injury, and hypercoagulability. And the factors acting in the postpartum stage are the trauma during delivery, as um, illustrated by that postpartum case where the pelvic vein thrombosis happens during or around the time of delivery, and the hypercoagulability, all the clotting factor changes that occur in pregnancy are maximal around the time of delivery because they are designed to stop women bleeding to death from obstetric hemorrhage. So at the time of delivery, as the placenta is delivered, that is when the, the hypercoagulability is at its uh, most potent. And that is when you are most at risk of forming blood clots. Hence why, if you need to give from the prophylaxis postpartum, it should be instituted as soon as possible postpartum. In the days before low molecular weight heparin, women used to receive unfractionated heparin on the table um, and then they were covered. Um, and early on in the days of low molecular weight heparin, we also used to give low molecular weight heparin on the table. All the rules about timing changed because low molecular weight heparin has a longer half-life and the anaesthetists were worried about the risk of epidural hematoma. So what is the risk postpartum? Overall, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Overall, pregnant women are four to five times more at risk of VTE than a non-pregnant woman. That risk is higher postpartum, twofold higher if you have a cesarean section and fourfold higher if you have an emergency cesarean section. So women delivered by elective cesarean section have double the postpartum risk compared to a woman having a vaginal birth. And if you look at all the studies comparing the risk postpartum, then the risk of cesarean section varies from two to sevenfold higher uh, compared to vaginal delivery. And I've just listed them on um, Oh, actually, I've taken that slide out. So this shows you, so these are, here we're talking about relative risk. Here, we're, we're talking about absolute risk. So this is a study I was involved in using GP research database. And this shows you the absolute risk of a first ever VTE in pregnancy. This is the risk in the first trimester, the second trimester, and the third trimester. Early postpartum, which means up to six weeks, late postpartum, which means six to 12 weeks and outside pregnancy. Now, as I've shown you already, the risk is highest postpartum, then in the third trimester, and then lowest in the first trimester. I've also explained that although the risk is lowest in the first trimester, you're more likely to die in the first trimester because you haven't come into contact with obstetric services, you haven't received from prophylaxis yet. There are also other complicated issues in the first trimester. You're more likely to bleed, you're more likely to have hyperemesis, you're more likely to have a miscarriage and surgery and all these increase your risk of having a clot and not being diagnosed. But look at how dramatic the, the postpartum risk is. This is not a, 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 a linear scale, it's a logarithmic scale. So there's a much, much higher risk in those first six weeks postpartum. 
So those were UK data. These are um, US data. This is a New England Journal of uh, in, uh, Medicine paper looking at, uh, again, a large database of women in California, looking at thrombotic events. And for the purposes of the next slide, I've just pulled out um, <clears throat> the venous thromboembolic events. And what they're doing is comparing the, the, the risk in the first year, um, in, in one year, comparing it with 24 weeks after delivery, and they can then determine a relative risk. So here you can see the odds ratio of um, a, a VTE in the three weeks postpartum compared with a year later in that woman's life. And similarly, the risk at 10 to 12 weeks postpartum compared to a year later. And you can see that the risk associated with the postpartum stage actually continues beyond six weeks. It's actually higher for up to four months postpartum. And you can see the, uh, the relative risks here. But in those first six weeks, the risk of a VTE is 12 times higher than the risk of a VTE <clears throat> a year later in that woman's life. Similar data, again from the US, this time using insurance data, and this time in weeks postpartum. And again, that postpartum risk is clustered in the first week. Yes, it's higher for six weeks, actually up to 12 weeks, but most of the risk occurs in that first week postpartum. Now, you will be aware that we have the Royal College of Obstetrician guidelines, <clears throat> and there are two of them. They're both slightly out of date now, and they to my knowledge, are both being updated. I was involved in the Green Top Guideline 37A, dealing with prevention, and there is another guideline dealing with treatment. So I'm going to concentrate mainly on the prevention guideline. And um, this, uh, I was the lead developer of this guideline. I'm not the lead developer of the updated guideline. So uh, those of you that work in obstetrics will be very familiar with this Appendix 1 in the guideline. And we divided um, the risk assessment into antenatal and postnatal, and you can see that cesarean section is pulled out um, in the intermediate risk group and in the lower risk group. So women having an elective cesarean section, according to the UK RCOG guideline, um, don't qualify for thromboprophylaxis with low molecular weight heparin unless they have another risk factor. In contrast, women having an emergency cesarean section, that is enough of a risk factor in and of itself to qualify for low molecular weight heparin prophylaxis. Now, the guideline has been not criticized, but it's been mentioned in the embrace inquiries and successive embrace inquiries, in fact, saying that people find this guideline hard to uh, use. They find the risk assessment confusing. And if you compound this with all the different electronic systems and paper systems, the bottom line is that when you look at the women that died from, from, from PE in pregnancy, many of them did not have an accurate risk assessment performed. So although I wrote this guideline, um, it is not perfect and people find it difficult to follow. Um, so I'm going to spend a few minutes going through this and trying to give you examples um, <clears throat> where, where um, people make mistakes, if you like, or where the guideline isn't followed very well. I'm so sorry. So this is hard to read. This is the overall risk of scoring system. And you can see, as I've said already, an emergency cesarean section gives you two points, an elective cesarean one point. Now for postnatal thromboprophylaxis, you only need two points. I'm not talking here about antenatal thromboprophylaxis, but it's four th for throughout pregnancy and three from 28 weeks. So um, postnatally, the guideline says that all women who've had a cesarean section should be considered for thromboprophylaxis for 10 days. And the only exception to that is women having elective cesarean sections who have no other additional risk factors. Those women don't need thromboprophylaxis. What are those uh, other risk factors? They are um, multiple pregnancy, obesity, preeclampsia, reoperation, immobilization, placenta previa. Um, and cesarean section is also not just a risk for clots, it's also a risk for deaths from PE. And I've already highlighted the risk for emergency cesarean section is higher. 
And this is the slide showing you those relative risks of cesarean section compared to vaginal delivery. So, as I've said, to qualify for postnatal thromboprophylaxis, you need two points. Women that you look after who've had previous VTE or previous um, recurrent VTE or high risk thrombophilias, all these women should be getting postpartum thromboprophylaxis because they're all getting antenatal thromboprophylaxis. So this is my first case. She's 38, she's para four, she's got a BMI of 46, she has an elective caesarean section at 39 weeks. She has a postpartum hemorrhage. And while I try and stop my coughing, um, I'll let you just calculate what you think the VTE score is at booking, and then what you think the score is postpartum. <clears throat> so at booking, she gets one for age, one for parity, two for obesity, because a BMI of a 30 is one, a BMI of a 40 is two. So her risk score antenatally is four. Her risk score postnatally is four, plus one for the elective section and one for the PPH, which is six. So, as I said, one for the elective section, and one for the PPH added to her baseline score makes six. This is the next case, 40 years old, IVF pregnancy, twins, BMI 41. She also has an elective section. She also has a PPH. <clears throat> She's sterilized at cesarean section. Postpartum, her score is also six. So one for the um, age, one for, um, Twins, not IVF, uh, IVF only counts antenatally, not postnatally. Two for BMI, one for elective section, one for PPH. So when would you start um, your low molecular weight heparin and for how long would you give it? So, as I said, IVF is only antenatal, multiple pregnancy gives you one and PPH gives you one. So um, this is a woman who has lots of risk factors and arguably you might wish to prolong her thromboprophylaxis <clears throat> as in the last lady for longer than 10 days. But that is a nuanced decision. There's nothing in the guideline that says you must continue beyond 10 days. It just says consider it if they have um, a risk score above three. So a lot of it depends on whether she's immobile or not. If she's up and about and looking after her twins, then I wouldn't give this woman more than 10 days thromboprophylaxis. If she's in bed with a wound infection, not able to mobilize for, what any, for whatever reason, then we would give her longer. Now, my last part of the talk, oh, I seem to be going backwards now, sorry. So I'm now going to share with you some data from the NIHR funded research, looking at the cost effectiveness and the um, a systematic review about risk assessment models. It's very complicated. And I would also ask you not to take photos or tweet any of these results because they're not yet published. Sarah Davis is the first author and um, she has very kindly shared her slides with me. So this is a large um, study that involved your medical director, Beverly Hunt, and myself and some other experts, Jan, Jan Dauru. And uh, we looked at risk assessment models um, and we looked um, at um, their value in assessing which women should receive pharmacological thromboprophylaxis. Currently, it's actually unclear whether we should offer thromboprophylaxis, whether we're offering it to too many women or too few. It's unclear what evidence we need to make better decisions. So the aim of this study was to quantify the current decision uncertainty associated with using risk assessment models, such as the RCOG model, to select women who are pregnant or postpartum for thromboprophylaxis, and to estimate the value of potential further studies that would reduce that uncertainty. Now, I don't have time to share all of the studies with you and all of the elements of this work. Um, so I'm going to concentrate on the second element. 
but it was a very large study. Firstly, we undertook a systematic review to identify all the risk assessment models and assess how well they predict who's going to have a VTE. Secondly, we performed decision analytic modeling to simulate different thromboprophylaxis strategies to determine the best strategy given what we know, in other words, the most cost effective, what factors make that decision uncertain and identify potential future studies. That's what I'm going to talk about. But we also undertook clinician surveys to assess if those studies would be feasible. In other words, was, would clinicians recruit to those studies? Secondly, we undertook workshops for um, women with lived experience of thromboprophylaxis and or VTE during pregnancy or after having pregnancy after VTE to assess if the studies were acceptable to them. And for this, I need to shout out to Thrombosis UK who very kindly help us recruit women. And lastly, we undertook decision analytic modeling to estimate the value of that future research. Now this is a huge piece of work and I haven't got time to discuss it all with you. So first of all, I, I've been asked to concentrate on postpartum thromboprophylaxis. So we undertook an analysis for antenatal thromboprophylaxis, but I'm not gonna talk about that. So for the postpartum thromboprophylaxis, um, we, we considered the population of women at intermediate risk who are offered 10 days of thromboprophylaxis after delivery. So according to the RCOG, that was either women having an emergency cesarean section or women with two other clinical risk factors, for example, age and obesity, or elective cesarean and preeclampsia, or elective cesarean and a postpartum hemorrhage. And we uh, looked at the subgroups to focus on the models. Unselected postpartum women, where we had information from four studies, obese postpartum women where we had information from one study and women after cesarean section where we had information from two studies. And the alternative strategies we, we were comparing were giving thromboprophylaxis to everyone, giving thromboprophylaxis to no one and giving thromboprophylaxis to those identified at high risk according to one of these risk assessment models. So I'm sorry about the complication of the, uh, the uh, complicated graph, but I'll try and talk you through it. Essentially, this is a rock curve showing sensitivity and specificity. And a good performing risk assessment model would fall the top of this line. So these ones um, and the poor risk assessment models are this side. And you can see that the, the Sultan study that I was involved in and the um, uh, with different cutoffs of risk and the RCOG risk assessment model fall here. So they are, they are quite uh, sensitive, but not very specific. So this now looks at cost effectiveness. To be cost effective, um, you need to fall below this blue line. So none of these risk assessment models are cost effective. Why are they not cost effective? Because the absolute risk of VTE postpartum is only 7.2 per 10,000 women. So we are trying to prevent a very rare condition. In other words, another way of looking at this is you would have to treat an awful lot of women to prevent one clot. And none of these risk assessment models uh, using quality of life years of 30,000, which is the um, uh, uh, cutoff, accepted cutoff for NICE, fall below this cutoff. Why are these risk assessment models uh, not effective and how might we make them more effective? So you'll remember I mentioned this study. So this is um, a American study specifically looking at uh, throm thrombosis risk in obese pregnant women. And you can see it's, it's very similar to the um, RCOG study, they identify all the risk factors and then they're able to apportion them a value. And uh, mode of delivery uh, is a very sensitive risk factor. It's a good predictor of thrombosis, which is why in their model, uh, like in the RCOG model, they apportion cesarean section delivery. Remember, we're only talking about obese women here, two points. And because they're only looking at obese women, all, all of the population have a BMI over, four, over 30. So they then give an extra point to the women with BMI over 40, an extra two points to BMI over 50. 
diabetes, heart disease, preeclampsia. So the risk factors are essentially the same length of stay, and they achieve a much better rock curve than that which I've shown you. Uh, but this Ellis Kahana model hasn't been validated in another um, population. So uh, it's a very interesting risk assessment model that we could perhaps use in the UK, but it needs validation. So just looking at obese postpartum women, this, this is the same blue line I've shown you before. So this shows you the degree of uncertainty using this risk assessment model versus um, no thromboprophylaxis. And there is high decision uncertainty because even in obese postpartum women, the risk is roughly double what it is in the non-obese postpartum women, where remember the absolute risk was seven per 10,000. But the spread is anywhere from very cost-effective to not at all cost-effective. In other words, we don't know the cost effectiveness of giving thromboprophylaxis to obese postpartum women according to the Ellis Kahana model. And shockingly, this is what I found shocking when I was involved in this research, is the reason we are uncertain is because we actually don't know how effective low molecular weight heparin is for thromboprophylaxis in pregnancy. We have extrapolated from surgical studies, orthopedic studies, and no one has done a large randomized controlled trial of low molecular weight heparin versus placebo for antenatal prophylaxis or postpartum thromboprophylaxis. And that is why you see this spread of uncertainty because although we know the cost of the low molecular weight heparin, we, we're not sure about the effectiveness. What about looking at post cesarean section? Well, here again, the risk is higher than the normal postpartum women at seven per 10,000. If you have a cesarean section, it doubles it as I've shown you already, but that's still a low absolute risk. And again, you see, and here it falls slightly more towards not being cost-effective, um, that, that we don't, there's a there's lot of decision uncertainty as to whether either using the uh, you know, RCOG, risk assessment model or the Binstock one, which is just another one of these published um, risk assessment models, we still have this huge degree of uncertainty about whether it's cost effective or not, but it looks as if it isn't. So what the Binstock model did was they took um, women, just looked at women having cesarean section, a relatively small study for these sorts of studies, but it had a very high sensitivity. In other words, it could predict everyone who had a blood clot but its specificity was very low. Why? Because it identified a lot of women who didn't have a blood clot in whom you ended up <clears throat> giving thromboprophylaxis. So the, the, this is the crux of the matter. These risk assessment models are unable to distinguish patients who will and will not have a VTE. So interestingly, the Binstock authors said universal thromboprophylaxis might be more effective. It's certainly easier to remember to give all women having cesarean section thromboprophylaxis, but is that the right thing to do? So this summarizes all the studies that we did looking at cost effectiveness. Now I've just shown you the data for postpartum women. Um, interestingly, antenatally, which I'll just touch on, high-risk antipartum women, so that's your woman with the previous VTE to whom we would normally give thromboprophylaxis, their risk is much higher. Their risk is five, 600 per 10,000. So for giving those women postpartum thromboprophylaxis, which is their time of highest risk of recurrence, um, <clears throat> they, there is um, still a high, degris, a high degree of uncertainty. Um, but if you only, but giving them antenatal is, is probably not cost effective. So although that's how I treat them, I give them antenatal and postnatal thromboprophylaxis, the probability of using another strategy, not giving them thromboprophylaxis antenatally is quite high. For postpartum obese women, um, the probability of another strategy other than the risk assessment model is also quite high. For postpartum women following cesarean section, um, we um, have a low degree of uncertainty. In other words, our research would suggest that giving these women no thromboprophylaxis is actually the most cost effective, which is what I found shocking. So I will stop there.
uh, a little bit of provocative research at the end there, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Catherine, for a very informative presentation and, and really get you thinking. Um, and I guess, that, well, there are many questions coming in. So I think if we go to the questions first, and then if there's time, um, there is one that I can quickly answer about downloading the presentation. The presentation has been recorded and by the end of the day will be available within the platform to review and catch up and, and watch again. So it will be available there. So looking at these questions, um, I think the first one that came in was around the Embrace slide about the key messages around, is this seven day thromboprophylaxis only for women after C-section or after normal vaginal delivery? <clears throat> it's for both. And actually, I apologise for the confusion. The current RCOG guideline actually recommends 10 days of thromboprophylaxis now, and it's for anyone with a risk score of two or more. So that could be a woman having an elective, uh, having a normal delivery who is obese and over 35. It's anyone with two risk factors. Okay, thank you. And then another panelist has asked, what risk assessment tool do you recommend for surgical termination of pregnancy? So different section, RCOG or Department of Health, pre-procedure and post-procedure. And what do you recommend as duration of thromboprophylaxis if VT score is three or four for miscarriage or surgical um, top? That is a brilliant question. So mm -hmm. thank you very, very much to the person who asked that. And my remit was to discuss post cesarean thromboprophylaxis, but uh, give me half a chance and I will discuss this issue because surgery, be it for an ectopic, for a miscarriage or for a termination of pregnancy, you're operating on a pregnant woman. She is still pregnant. Therefore, you are performing surgery on a pregnant woman. And that's risky. And I think the gynecologists do not agree with me, but I think that all women undergoing surgery in the first trimester should be offered 10 days of thromboprophylaxis after that surgery. Now, it's a little bit more nuanced because we now have medical management of miscarriage, so no operation. She might not need it. Women undergoing termination of pregnancy now, even surgically, can have a, uh, I forget what they call it, but I think it's an MVA, a manual vacuum aspiration, I think it stands for, where, where it's a not it's a it's a less um intrusive operation than what used to happen with with a, with a dnc and the gynecologists argue with me and say this is low risk surgery kathy they say so i'm not i don't like arguing with the gynecologist but what i would say is <clears throat> women having miscarriages where they bleed and they bleed and they bleed and they're still bleeding and then a week later they have to go back for an operation those women should be having thromboprophylaxis. It's really hard because they're bleeding and you don't want to exacerbate the bleeding risk. <clears throat> but maybe if I modify it and say, as the, as the Green Top Guideline says, is assess them, look at their risk factors, look at their age, look at their weight, look at whether they've got an infection. So I'm, I'm glossing around this question because it appears as a risk factor in the RCOG guideline surgery in the first trimester which to my mind includes surgery <clears throat> for a um, termination of pregnancy uh, those women should be risk assessed and if they have any other risk factor I would offer them thromboprophylaxis that's what I would do but I don't manage these women they're managed by gynecologists on the gynae ward so I don't know I would very much like to know what the host what the person asking the question thinks about that um, but maybe they can um, write something else in the chat and we can look at it if we have time at the end. And perhaps it shows the, the need for that uh, multidiscipline discussion around individual needs and care and safety. A absolutely, Joe. And on, on that note, um, you know, the guideline is a guideline. And I, I feel very um, defensive of it because myself and my co-developers, <clears throat> I'm so sorry about my throat. I don't have a cough. I'm not ill, I promise. I just have a frog in my throat. Um, uh, we tried to make it easy. But we accept now, you know, seven years later, that it's, sorry, six years later, it's not easy. People find it difficult because people are busy and risk assessment is, is, has to be fitted in to other clinical work. But you, you have to individualize. The, it's about the woman herself 
And it's also, we leave out the bit about explaining to the woman why we're giving her thromboprophylaxis. A woman is not gonna inject herself every day unless somebody takes the time to explain why. She's gonna think, well, I don't know what this is for. They said something about thinning the blood, but I don't know why I've got to thin my blood. So, uh, you know, we can talk about this some more, Joe. but I'm sure you have, you're just as able as I am to discuss this issue. Unless you include the woman in that risk assessment decision-making, you can prescribe all the low molecular weight heparin in the world. It ain't gonna happen. I agree. And I think, you know, one of the fears is, will it harm my baby, both the, the medication itself, but also the injecting. And interestingly, um, approximately about a year ago, we did a film just showing you how to and why it's um, important to inject low molecular weight heparin. And that film has had the greatest number of views that we've ever produced. Um, it's, it's just incredible, over 200,000. So it shows the interest and the need out there. And actually, when you're talking about this, the complexity of it, is there, are there plans? Because a lot of your presentation showed what we don't know as well. So where, where do you see the priority or the plans for the next piece of research to try to help us make better informed judgments? Yeah, that's, that's a good question, Joe. And I didn't have time to discuss it. But what, we, what that piece of work concludes is that the, the best value research is actually to do um, a trial of high-risk women in pregnancy. But when we spoke to the clinicians and the women, both groups find that unpalatable as research. They are not in equipoise. They would not be happy to randomize. And the women themselves who suffered VTE would not join that research because probably because they've been taught by the UK hematologists and thrombosis nurses that they need thromboprophylaxis. So those women would not enter the research. So we can't do that research because it wouldn't work. You couldn't recruit to it. The next most valuable piece of research which is more feasible because there is equipoise would be to do a study of postpartum women <clears throat> potentially concentrating on obese women but not necessarily um, because there it's still uh, there's still a high degree of uncertainty but uh, women would you're recruiting women for a shorter period of time uh, and you you would clinicians would recruit into that study and women would come into that study because they can see the balance of preventing blood clots after delivery versus the pain in the neck that is injecting when you've got a newborn baby. So um, that that is probably the, the conclusion and that will then go to the NIHR and then what will happen is then there will be a call for researchers to put in a bid to do that research. Now the next question is are you gonna make it placebo controlled? I know, cause I've tried to recruit to a placebo controlled study of low molecular weight heparin. Uh, would, would women inject something that has saline in it? I think not. <laughs> so we'd have to do some sort of stepwise bringing on different centers, not using placebo. In other words, an open, not, uh, not a double blind and open uh, randomized study of heparin versus no heparin or heparin versus flotrons. Um, I mean, I don't, God forbid, I don't want to use stockings, uh, but I do know that there's a study going on in Canada looking at heparin versus aspirin later on. And I am a little perplexed as to how they've got this through because I didn't think that aspirin was effective at thromboprophylaxis, but there is a large Canadian study looking at that. So I don't know what the NIHR will decide with the report, and I don't know what the call will say, but I suspect it will concentrate on postpartum thromboprophylaxis. And I think you're right as well. At this point, when our women are dealing with newborn babies as well, it, it, it's got to be something very palatable and very doable for them because it's not a stress-free and a relaxed time, <laughs> even in the easiest of babies, is it? So it has to work for the individuals. Um, a more specific question about when women um, should go back on to, say, a warfarin after delivery if they're already using it before pregnancy. That's also a brilliant question. I love talking to this group because they ask all the really good questions. Yeah, so I never overlap. So it, it, so for women requiring warfarin, they're usually on a high, high dose prophylaxis or a full treatment. Sorry, so BD, they're normally on a BD regime of low molecular weight heparin. Um, and there is a big risk of bleeding when you overlap therapeutic or high prophylaxis heparin with warfarin. There is a big risk of bleeding postpartum. So I never, ever, ever start warfarin before day five because every time I've done that, almost without exception, 
I have caused postpartum hemorrhage, even women having vaginal deliveries. I've seen terrible vulval hematomas, particularly in my heart valve patients where we're giving bigger doses of heparin, but that overlap, that bridge, until the warfarin's therapeutic is a dangerous time because you're doubly anticoagulating the woman. So I don't start warfarin until day five. The only time that I do would be those first trimester women who are having a straightforward termination on miscarriage where you wanna get them back on the warfarin. So everything I just said about 10 days doesn't pertain if you want to get them back on the warfarin. So once the operation's done, then I start loading them because the risk of bleeding there is lower. But for the women having, deliveries at term or near term I wait till day five to start the warfarin because then the bleeding risk has gone down it's a pain because you have to bring them back to, to you can't do it in hospital you know everyone was trying to be helpful starting the warfarin soon but you cause bleeding so I don't do that anymore okay thank you gosh so looking at the other questions that have come through um, one from Bex. Does the Davis et al. study assume that women are using low molecular weight heparin? They have been prescribed postnatally. And is this a reasonable assumption? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow, Bex. Uh, it does. It does assume 100 um, percent adherence with what is prescribed there it there's I can see there's another question about bleeding risk, which I'll come to in a minute. But but for, for Bex, yes, you have to assume uh, these models, I mean, I'm not a health economist and I found the study fascinating, but also I got brain ache every time we had a meeting because you make these assumptions. You, you right, this is the cost and this is the how, how many clots you're going to prevent and this is how many bleeds you're going to cause and this is the balance. So you have to assume that the heparin is actually getting into the patient. But you're absolutely right, Bex. We all know that we prescribe low molecular like, like, heparin and it you know it's it gets thrown away it doesn't even get sent back to the hospital it gets wasted because i think women don't want to admit sometimes that they haven't used it um so people have tried to do <clears throat> adherence compliance whatever you want to call it studies um and returning unused medication but it's difficult to do and you know bex as well as i do that women go out into the ether of the community they're lost to, to secondary follow up and we actually honestly don't know what happens we don't know how many of those women actually take the heparin we do know from the confidential inquiry that some women don't take it because when they die we find their unused heparin which is tragic thank you there's a number of questions around guidelines and updates about when will the rcog guideline be available the updated version um, and also some of the confusions around it, which really takes us back to training and ongoing training in a sense. Um, do you think more should be done? And are there plans that you're aware of to in, within training to do much more around the risk of VTE, pregnancy, postpartum, C-section? Yeah, that's also a good question. So firstly, I'm not the lead developer anymore, so I have no idea when the new guideline will be out. I suspect they are waiting for the NIHR study to be published because it would be a bit silly not to. It would be silly to develop a guideline and then have a piece of work showing that it might not be cost effective. Uh, and many of you will be aware, those of you that work outside London, I don't know if there's anyone from Wales here, but the Welsh have developed their own version of the RCOG guideline, which is a bit cheaper because it's a bit less aggressive. Um, and there are lots of sort of um, versions of this guideline around. But um, the question you've asked, Joe, is about training. Now, in obstetrics, we have something called prompt training, which all midwives undergo, and it should include VTE risk assessment and scoring systems. And in my hospital, it does. Does that translate to on the ward, real time training on the job? No, it does not. And I think you've hit the nail on the head, Joe. I think we, I think the NHS is in crisis. I think it's underfunded, understaffed. I think midwives have the hardest job in the world and there aren't enough of them. And they have two patients. Once that woman's delivered, they've got the mother, the baby. And, you know, we have this somebody somewhere introduced this bonkers idea of a tick box for risk assessment but nowhere in that tick box does it assess the quality of that risk assessment. They just have to tick a box and say they've done it. Who invented that as an idea? It's stupid. 
so what you're talking about, Joe, is quality improvement work around the education of midwives. And let's not leave the obstetricians out of this. They they get just as confused about the guideline. And but although it pains me to say it, Lucy McKillop and myself and Peter McCullum spent hours on that table trying to make it simple. All you've got to do is add up to four. That's all you've got to do. But in a real life situation on labor ward, it doesn't happen. When you're booking a patient, I don't know if you've seen what the midwives have to do. In an hour, I think maybe it might be an hour and a half now, they have to go through a million of those checklists for every medical comorbidity, domestic violence, HIV, past obstetric history. They spend hours and hours going through different checklists. Yes, VTE is there. And yes, in electronic systems and paper systems, it's there. Does it happen? sometimes mm -hmm. yeah. so you know again thrombosis uk has a role here because unless women and midwives i should probably say pregnant people not women forgive me unless pregnant people and midwives understand the point the importance then that will not translate into practice so you know education such 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 as today uh, and focused education for every new intake of midwives is so important uh, and that costs money but I believe the way to educate isn't actually in prompt scenarios I believe it's on the floor in real time with you know like we used to have with mentors and supervisors and you know okay what would you do but for that requires a whole nother member of staff to work and we don't have those staff everybody on this call knows that i do agree with you and i know it's something from British uk is looking at and has also recently developed a specific risk assessment or not vt um, risk awareness card for um pregnant and postpartum individuals uh, yes. which is freely available now, but is a really critical area. You've mentioned the risk of bleed and the risk of harm, and there are several questions around that. Um, so about whether you get a feeling for bleed risk in the postpartum setting, um, and could we be causing harm with thromboprophylaxis with the some of the lack of full understanding we have now, um, and concerns with vagina bleeding um, is further increased with low molecular weight heparin, um and compliance in this patient group so right so, so i'll take the bleeding risk first yes in the model we absolutely did consider bleeding risk and <clears throat> we actually had to calculate what's the risk of an intracerebral hemorrhage from the low molecular weight heparin and what's the cost to the nhs of of a bleeding complication and the uh the the Low molecular weight heparin is a pretty safe drug, but no drug is absolutely safe and no drug is without side effects and low molecular weight heparin does increase the bleeding risk. So that was calculated. Uh, do I have a feel for the actual risk? Um, not on the top of my head, but it was put into the model. And what I do know is for obese women, they not only have a higher thrombosis risk, they also have a higher bleeding risk. So the group that you most want to give thromboprophylaxis to are also the group at higher risk of bleeding. And part of that is to do with the fact that we make up doses. You all know that we made up those doses about what to do with a weight over 90 or and the different low molecular weight heparins have different weight cutoffs. And we all know it's made up. Nobody's done those studies to properly look at pharmaco kinetics in very underweight or very overweight women so those doses are made up and it may be I often think that when we're treating very obese women we probably are over treating them because does their weight all relate translate to the pharmacokinetics of low molecular weight heparin probably not so to answer Rick's question yes we did very much look at bleeding risk and yes it is an issue and this feeds into the model that's why you need a study like this with with health economics because you need to it's not just how many clots do you prevent how many postpartum limbs you know post post phlebitic syndrome um how many quality of life years do you save by giving low molecular weight heparin it's also what harm do you cause by prolonged hospital stay with a hemorrhage and uh you know fatal hemorrhage which comes it's very rare but you have to put that into the model so yes this is why this is exactly why the health economic studies do fall down on the side of 
not worth it. Uh, and I find that very difficult because they put a cost to a life. They put a cost to a PE. And as clinicians, we go, that's very unpalatable. I don't like that. But, you know, it's research, it's modeling. It has to be discussed openly and honestly. You know, some women, some women could die as a result of the low molecular weight heparin prophylaxis. And we, we must be honest about that. It's very, very, very rare, but it's possible. Nothing, nothing is harm free. Okay, thank you, Catherine. Um, and the second part of that was about the RCOG VT risk assessment used and reassessed. So pre-surgery, a VT risk of three and post-surgery VT score three, and um, no thromboprophylaxis, VT score four or more, 10 days thromboprophylaxis. Are there uh, that's, that's talking yeah. about first trimester, I think. Um, used and risk pre-surgery VTE oh they're, they're giving an example so pre-surgery yeah. her risk was three post-surgery her risk is three yes I think that's referring to surgery in the first trimester I think that's the person coming back maybe mm -hmm. when I was talking about miscarriage concerns with vaginal bleeding which is further increasing compliance in the, yeah I mean I've no idea what compliance in the patient group in the first trimester is because I'm pretty sure that most of them don't have a chat with someone about why we're sending them home with injections I'm pretty sure that you know that happens sporadically in the pregnant women who are on the, the postpartum women on the postnatal ward I think women on the gynae ward maybe it's better maybe gynae nurses who are used to dealing with gynae oncology and surgery are better at it than midwives I, I actually don't know Thank you, Catherine. I'm aware we're running out of time. This is such an interesting topic. And I guess just to end on, the multidiscipline team or all those, and I know we're well into the hundreds now watching, when they um, have these queries, there are support networks they can go to either within their hospitals and trusts or further afield. If there's questions and queries, what would you recommend anybody who's just unsure to do or where they can get more clarity? Thank you, Joe, because that allows me to plug the maternal medicine networks that are now coming all over the UK. For those of you that might have joined, the, there's a British Society of Haematology special interest group that had their meeting last week, and I spoke to them about the networks. But essentially, wherever you are in England, and this is only England, sadly, you will work within a maternal medicine network that will have a hub hospital and spoke hospitals. There will be a lead haematologist for obstetrics in the hub hospital. At St. Thomas's, we're lucky to have two or three of them, but uh, that is the person. You go to an expert in thrombosis and pregnancy, which might not be your local haematologist. I'm just gonna put it out there. It might not be your local haematologist. Depends where you work and depends how big your obstetric unit is and it depends what experience the people there have. But there will always be a person, an obstetric physician like myself working in the hub hospital, wherever you are in the UK, in, in England, and attached to that hub hospital, working in that hub hospital will be a lead haematologist. So my advice is go to the, the team, the MDT team, which includes the thrombosis um, nurses who work in the hub hospital dealing with this all day, every day. And if you don't know who they are, contact your, um, mater just search Maternal Medicine Network, Yorkshire and Humber or wherever you are, and you you'll find where it is. And if, if all else fails, email me. Catherine, fantastic. Thank you so much. And for everybody watching, this will be available at the end of the day. But thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Very much, Joe. Bye.